and welcome. How would you like to learn how to use the untapped power of your mind to quickly and readily reduce stress, be relaxed, and enjoy life more? To have picture-perfect memory and learn faster? To think of what you want and manifest them in your life? To think of solutions to problems quickly and easily, make faster and easier decisions? To improve your relationships at home, in love, and on the job? Well, today you're going to learn to do all that and much more with this video on the Silva Method, the world's foremost mind development program. Hi, I'm Laura Silva. My father, Jose Silva, is one of the world's leading researchers in mind and human potential and founder of the Silva Method. I have been presenting the Silva Method's basic lecture series and advanced seminars here in this country and throughout the world and have written two books on it. I'm particularly excited about this opportunity to share with you powerful mind training techniques that can truly change your life around. But first, a bit of history. Back in 1944, my father, Jose Silva, became interested in the study of mind. He studied psychologists like Freud, Jung, and Adler. He studied psychology, parapsychology, and hypnosis. He became a master hypnotist himself. My parents had 10 children, and because of that, my father's greatest concern was that his children grow up to be successful in life. He believed education was the key. He decided to use hypnosis to help his children learn faster and easier in order to make better grades in school. While working with my sister, Isabel, one of his eldest daughters, he noticed that while she was under hypnosis, she began to finish some of his sentences. Later on, he noticed that she began to guess partially, accurately, answers to questions. Later still, Isabel began to guess accurate answers to questions she had absolutely no way of knowing. Well, one thing led to another, and in 1966, the first Silver Method lecture series was presented in Amarillo, Texas, to a group of artists who wanted to improve their creativity. Well, the rest of the story is its incredible growth throughout the world. We are now in 98 countries and 29 languages, and millions have benefited from these powerful mind training techniques. It doesn't matter what age you are, it doesn't matter what your culture is, education or religion, the Silva Method can truly help each and every one of you. By practicing the seven Silva Method techniques that you'll learn on this video, together with the accompanying audio cassette provided, you will learn how to make great changes in your life even turn your life around. What are some of the areas that you desire to make changes in your life? Well, most people want to make changes in the areas of health, finances, and relationships. People realize that they can benefit their health areas by using more mind. There is a branch of study, a branch of learning called psychoneuroimmunology, which deals with the influence the mind has on the brain and over the immune system. Many people have found themselves with incurable illnesses and have returned back to health, perfect health, by using the Silva Method techniques. In the areas of business, for instance, people have realized that by learning how their attitudes, their thoughts, and their belief systems influence what they attract into their lives, they have been able to find work, increase their income, find jobs, and actually even create new businesses. The same is true in relationships. People have realized that they can improve their relationships at home, in love, and on the job by learning what patterns are unresourceful and unproductive, what habits and what programs they need to correct. The reason people change is because they desire to change. That is the main thing. Do you really and truly desire to make these changes? The tools are here and the Silver Method can offer them to you. First, a little bit about how the brain functions. The brain emits electrical impulses. Now, these electrical impulses fall into a pattern or a rhythm. This rhythm, this frequency, can be measured with an electroencephalograph, or EEG for short. When the brain is emitting between 14 and 21 cycles, or frequency is 14 and 21 cycles per second of brain wave activity, it is said to be functioning at beta. Between 7 and 14 cycles per second is called alpha. Between 4 and 7 cycles per second is called theta. And anything above 0 to 4 cycles per second is called delta. 
Now, depending on what you're doing, your brain frequency is going to go faster or slower. And that means if you are awake, daydreaming, or asleep. You see, speeding up or slowing down the brain frequency is something the brain already knows how to do naturally. What we're going to learn how to do here is slow it down to alpha and be able to work with it with a purpose in mind. Our goal is to have conscious awareness, apply the techniques, and make great changes. When the brain is functioning at beta, its focus is on the outer conscious levels in the outer world, the physical world. And it incorporates or is impressed by information that it perceives through its physical senses. And the physical senses are very limited to time or space. It's also impressed with information based on its various thoughts that it, that it experiences. As you begin to slow down your brain frequency, you're able to enter the alpha frequency. And that you can do with the accompanying tape that is provided. By practicing the mental exercise, you will be able to slow down your brain frequency and function at alpha with awareness. Functioning with alpha comes with also utilizing your mental senses, and those are not limited to time or space. As you continue to relax and you keep a passive mind, your brain frequency can go into theta. At theta, the goal is to not generate any thoughts whatsoever, not to visualize anything either. The goal there is just to allow your body, your brain, and your mind just to be, just to relax. This is excellent for healing the body. As you continue to deepen your relaxation, your frequency continues to slow down and you enter the delta frequency. That is known as the unconscious state of mind. It's also known as the area the brain goes to or the frequency the brain goes to when it is experiencing deep sleep. One of the very many values of going into alpha is that you're able to utilize a whole new set of senses. And these sets of senses have no boundaries to time or space. This means you can time travel. You, go, you can go into the future, go into the past without any limitations whatsoever. This also means that you can go through dimensions, through matter, through the different levels and depths of matter. Can you imagine what that means? Can you imagine how much information you can learn to get and apply it towards problem solving? The more problems you solve, the more successful you become. The more information you have, the more problems you can solve. Most people, when they practice some sort of relaxation, they tend to go so deep that they enter sleep. They haven't learned how to stop at the alpha frequency. And they continue going through delta, uh, through theta, all the way into delta. Well, here you're not going to do that. You're going to learn how to stop at alpha, stay there, use your mental senses creatively, think of solutions to problems, and become more successful in any area of life that you desire. When you are at alpha, you become much more creative. You can think of five, six, seven solutions to problems, not just one. You become solution-oriented, not problem-filled. And to be able to think of solutions means, again, that you're going to become even more and more successful. Let's say, for example, I found myself, for whatever reason, with just one leg. Standing would be difficult. Jogging would be very difficult. Even playing tag with, with my kids would be very hard to do. But I don't have one leg. I have two legs. Does this mean that because I have two legs, I can run faster, twice as fast, that I can play tag with my kids twice as effectively? In some cases, that's true. But in most cases, it means that I can do things 10 times better, 100 times better. You see, with the subtle method and learning to function at alpha and using your mental senses, you're able to then come out and unlock that door of that prison that has held you back from having it all that prison that has kept you from being a successful and to totally functioning human being. When you use a silver method, you're able to use two sets of senses now, your outer conscious physical senses and your inner conscious mental senses. You have two modes of thinking. You have your right brain thinking and you have your left brain thinking as well. You have two dimensions to function in. You can say that we have four different bodies within ourselves, your physical, spiritual, emotional, and your mental. Each one of those bodies has certain requirements that it must go through in order for it to keep healthy. 
The physical body needs to breathe, it needs to eat properly, exercise, things of that sort. The physical body also needs to rest. That's different than sleeping. That means you are resting. Resting is a form of meditation, relaxation. And it needs to do that to keep healthy. The spiritual body needs to pray. And prayer is a form of meditation. The mental body, in order to touch base with that part of us within, needs to do so through meditation. It takes alpha to unlock those doors. And alpha is accomplished through meditation. And the emotional body, in order for us to touch base with our emotions, with our true self within, we need to focus within, and that too requires meditation. Meditation is the meeting ground to strengthen the four bodies, to keep each one healthy, and to also strengthen the connection of the spirit, the mind, the emotions, and the physical body, to enjoy true and total health and success. In order to start making changes and to help ensure success with any of the subtle method techniques, there are certain elements that we want to go over. For instance, desire, belief, and expectancy. Ask yourself, how much desire do you have to manifest a goal, a thought? Right now, think of a particular thought that you have in mind. How much do you desire that? Think of a goal. How much do you desire that? See, desire allows our intelligence to focus on those things that we truly want to attract into our lives and start making them happen, start manifesting them. If I was to ask you, how much desire do you have to manifest a goal, what would you say? A lot. A lot. What about you? Uh, the utmost. The utmost. How about you? How much desire would you have? A lot. A lot. A lot. Well, a lot of what? Physical words cannot explain or describe subjective energies, subjective experiences. The same is true about belief and expectation. How much belief do you have that you can make changes in your life? How much belief do you have that you deserve these changes, that you deserve the best? How much belief do you have in yourself that you can truly make a difference? It's very important to have belief as well as desire and expectancy. Many times we have the experience or the, the, the knowledge that what we have gone through in life has led to a certain limiting belief. In fact, it's what we believe in that is going to create what we're going to go through in life. You need to have enough desire, belief, and expectation to make it happen. These are three very important subjective elements, and we call that faith. Do you have faith in yourself? Do you have faith in your capabilities? Do you have faith in your mental abilities, in your potential as a human being to make these changes and turn your life around? How do you build faith? How do you build desire, belief, and expectation? Well, there's two ways of doing that. One way is through repetition. You can repeat in form of affirmations what it is that you truly desire, believe, and expect. Or you can also go into alpha and from alpha build more of these subjective energies. Being that you're now in the subjective dimension, that's the ideal place to build elements like desire, belief, and expectancy. You will go into your level and you visualize how your life is now, your present situation, in order to know what you're leaving. And then you create an image of what it is that you desire to attract into your life. Visualization and imagination are two other elements aside from desire, belief, and expectation. When you can clearly define in your mind what it is that you desire, believe, and expect, visualize where you are and know what you're leaving, and imagine what you want to attract into your life, then the next element would be action. To take the appropriate action to manifest what it is that you want to, to create into your life. Desire, belief, expectation, visualization, imagination, and action. The action will come when the other elements are strong enough and there for you. Today you're going to learn the seven method techniques that work best at Alpha. In order to enter Alpha, you can listen to and practice the mental exercise on the audio cassette provided. Find a quiet moment to practice and then listen to the exercise.
When you have accumulated about two hours of practice time, then you enter level using the three to one method, followed by a 10 to one countdown for additional depth and relaxation. And then follow that with the technique of your choice. You're welcome to stop the, the video cassette right now and listen to your alpha exercise on the audio cassette and then come back to this point a little bit later. Or you're welcome to follow the instructions I'll give you during this mental exercise right now. So find a comfortable position. Palms up, palms down, feet flat on the ground. Close your eyes. All eyes closed. Take a deep breath. And while exhaling, mentally repeat and visualize the number three, three times. Take another deep breath. And while exhaling, mentally repeat and visualize the number two, three times. Take another deep breath, and while exhaling, mentally repeat and visualize the number one three times. You are now at level one. This is the basic plane level that you are able to use for a purpose, any purpose you desire. To help you learn to relax physically, I'm going to call your attention to different parts of your body. Relax your scalp. Relax your forehead. Relax your eyelids and the tissue surrounding your eyes. Relax your face. Relax your throat and your neck, externally and internally. Relax your shoulders, arms, and hands. Relax your chest, externally and internally. Relax your abdominal area, externally. Now take a deep breath, and while exhaling, relax your abdominal area, internally. Relaxing every cell, every tissue, every gland and causing them to function in a healthy rhythmic manner. Relax your thighs. Relax your knees. Relax your calves. Relax your feet. Whenever you need to enter deeper, healthier levels of mind, just think of tranquil and passive thoughts. This will help your mind to relax. Anything that makes your mind tranquil and passive helps to enhance relaxation, both physically and mentally. Something else to do is think of a possible outcome that you desire. Picture it in your mind and then go for it. What you think you will attract into your life. The stronger the thought, the clearer the picture, the easier it's going to be to manifest that into your life. Once you are at Alpha and you're practicing for health problems, Visualize yourself where you are, 
as far as a health problem is concerned, and imagine your health problem getting better and better and better. Imagine yourself getting healthier and healthier. This goes along with that branch of learning called psychoneuroimmunology. Your mind telling your brain and your immune system what to do. The body will then respond and help in the healing process. Whenever you work at these levels for health problems, consult your physician and work with your health supervisor's support. Take a deep breath. And while exhaling, enter a deeper, healthier level of mind, deeper than before. Again, make points of reference of your experience here at Alpha. How do your muscles feel? How's your heart beating? Is your temperature change? What are your thoughts like? This is what you call physical relaxation. Whenever you have a desire or need to enter physical relaxation, remember these points of reference. Remember this experience that you're having now. To relax the mind, simply think of tranquil and passive scenes. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to five. At the count of five, you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. You will have no ill effects whatsoever in your head, no headache, no ill effects whatsoever in your hearing, no buzzing in your ears, no ill effects whatsoever in your vision and eyesight. Vision, eyesight and hearing improve every time you function at these levels of the mind. One, two, coming out slowly now, three, at the count of five you will open your eyes, be wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before, feeling the way you feel when you have slept the right amount of revitalizing, refreshing, relaxing, healthy sleep, four, five, eyes open, wide awake, feeling fine and in perfect health, feeling better than before. Earlier I mentioned how through meditation you're able to strengthen the connection of the physical body, the spiritual body, the mental body, and the emotional body. Have you ever wondered, what is the language of meditation? Ask yourself right now. What is the language of meditation? Who can tell me? Thoughts. Thoughts, yes. And how do we represent our thoughts? Pictures. Pictures. The language of meditation is pictures or through imagery we speak with ourselves, mind to mind, mind to body, mind to other minds, or mind to the universe. Have you ever wondered where it is that you picture these thoughts? Let's do something here. Let's try a little, ex little experiment. Everybody close your eyes for just a few moments. And imagine that you're walking down a long hallway of an old Victorian house. Look around at the beautiful environment. And as you look ahead of yourself, way down at the end of the, of the hallway, you see against the wall that there's a table with a vase. And the vase is filled with flowers. And behind that beautiful scene, the closer you get, the clearer it, it, the clearer it gets. Behind that beautiful scene is a velvet backdrop. Get close enough to reach out and touch that velvet backdrop. What color is it? How does it feel when you touch it? Stand back a few steps. Now look at that beautiful sight. What kind of vase is it? What kind of flowers are they? What color are they? Take another step back, and as you do, keeping your eyes closed, lift your arm and hand and point to where you're picturing that scene. 
everybody here and now, lift your arm and hand and point to where you're picturing this scene. Come on, point, point, point. Now keep your hands and arms in that position, open your eyes and look around. The area that you're pointing to is what we call the mental screen. You may relax your arms again. It's what we call the mental screen. The mental screen seems to be out and away from us. That's an area that we project our mental, set, our mental images on too. The mental screen is about 20 degrees above the horizontal plane or level of sight. And we want to develop the use of the mental screen. The mental screen helps us to look at ourselves objectively. It helps us to identify our present state, our challenges, our life as it is right now. It helps us to be able to accept our challenges. And then at the same time, once we accept them, get out of denial. Acceptance is the biggest step towards problem solving. The mental screen also helps us to define our goals and what we want to attract into our lives. When the mind and the brain can clearly define the goals, then the body will then do whatever it can to manifest them. But they need to be clearly defined in your mind first. Now, how do we develop the use of the mental screen? We develop its use by projecting images onto the screen. Images having color, having action, being humorous, exaggerating these images in size and number. This is how we develop to use the mental screen. Whenever you visualize or imagine anything, add color and action to your images to have clearer vision or what is also known as clairvoyance. One of the best ways that we have found to improve the use of the mental screen is by projecting images onto it. And one of the best tools that we have for doing that is the memory peg system. The memory peg system is based on the system that is created by Bruno First. It says that every number of our number system is assigned a special letter, a consonant. And those consonants will always have those numbers to represent them. Vowels, silent letters, do not have any numerical value. The idea is to memorize and to learn memory pegs, which always stay the same, and then associate an unknown object to the memory peg. The peg, because it remains the same, utilizes visualization. Visualization is one aspect of imagery. But visualization is when you describe in detail and color something that has already been visually impressed on your brain cells. The process of creating an image for the first time is imagination. Well, the memory peg system is ideal for that in that the peg always remains the same. You always visualize the same peg without any changes every time you use the system. What changes is how you associate the ob object to the peg. In the association process, you are imagining. And that's a creative process there. Let's do a simple demonstration. I want you all to start thinking about maybe a word or two, an object, a clear object or two, so that we can go through this briefly. And I'll just ask you to give me the objects. OK? All right. Object number one. Anybody? A purse. A purse. OK. Object number two. Chair. A chair. Object number three. Glass. A glass. Any particular kind of glass. Water. A water glass like the one I have here. Object number four. A statue. A statue of what? Of a man. Of a man? Mm -hmm. Okay, a statue of a man. Thank you. Object number five. A baseball. A baseball. Regular old baseball. Signature baseball or not? <laughs> the kind they use in professional sports. Okay, the kind they use in professional sports. Object number six. A ring. A ring. Any particular kind of ring. Gold ring? A gold ring. Object number seven. Bulldog. A bulldog. And it's a brown in color, bulldogs? Brown. Okay. Object number seven is a bulldog. Object number eight. Computer. A computer. Any particular brand of computer? Apple. An Apple computer. Okay. Object number nine. 
A Ferrari. A Ferrari. Any particular color Ferrari? A red Ferrari. <laughs> okay. Object number 10. A can, of corn. a can of corn. Okay. Object number 10 is a can of corn. Object number 11. A pillow. A pillow. A big fluffy pillow, a small pillow, any particular kind? A big fluffy pillow. Object number 12. A clock. Any particular kind of clock? An old grandfather clock. An old grandfather clock. Okay. Object number 13. A piano. A piano. A particular kind of piano? Grand piano. A grand piano. Any particular color? Okay. Brown? <laughs> Object number 14. A horse. Object number 14, a horse. Any kind of horse? A great dappling one. A great dappling ones? Yeah. Okay. Object number 15. Bicycle wheel. A bicycle wheel for object number 15. Yes. Okay. A bicycle wheel. All right. Great. Now let's go over the object list. One, purse. Two, chair. Three, glass of water. Four, statue. Five, baseball. Six, gold ring. Seven, bulldog. Eight, computer. Nine, Ferrari. 10, a can of corn, 11, a big fluffy pillow, 12, grandfather clock, 13, a grand piano, 14, a, a horse, and 15, a bicycle wheel. You can do that and much more than that. It's very easy to do. The memory peg system is based on the numbers in our vocabulary, or alphabet, I should say. Every number has a consonant and its phonetic sound. Number one is T, or the sound that resembles T, like D. When your teeth, your tongue, and your lips are in basically the same position, we call that somewhat of a phonetic sound. So we have T or D for number one. You add vowels, which have no numerical value, and you form the word T, with T, E, and A. So I imagine a big, huge glass of iced tea, exaggerated in size, and instead of having a lot of ice cubes that I'm stirring around, there are a lot of purses in there. Number two, the letter for number two is N. Now, the two and the N resemble themselves a bit, because if you have two sticks like this, and you connect them, you form the letter N. Add vowels and a silent letter, vowels like O and A, and add the other letter H, and you have the word Noah. Noah is a biblical character who built the ark. I just pictured a chair going up the ramp into Noah's ark. Number three is similar. You have three sticks connected forms an M. Add the vowels A and Y, and you have the word May. So I have a picture calendar of the month of May. And I associate the glass of water with the picture calendar in whatever way is funny to me, exaggerated, with lots of color and action. Number four, the fourth letter of the word for, F-O-U-R, is the beginning word for this next peg. Add the A and the Y, and you create the word Ray. Ray rhymes with May as well, makes it easier to remember. Peg number four is Ray. So I imagine four sun rays shining into a window upon a statue. Number five, when I lift my hand up and I say, stop in the name of the law, I also form the letter L right here. Law is the peg word for number five. The A is a vowel, W is silent. The object that you associate with that is baseball. You can imagine police officers playing baseball. Number six is the letter J. If you imagine a jaw of a person, because a peg word is jaw, and you follow the shape of the jaw, you create the letter J, or the number six. So six will be J, and the peg word is jaw. That rhymes with law. So I imagine a man with a large jaw biting into a gold ring. Number seven is the peg word key, and it starts with the letter K. Imagine a seven with an inverted seven leaning on it, and then add the letter E and Y, and you form the word key. That's your peg word. I imagined a bulldog with a key that you need to insert to crank it up and make it run. Number eight 
is the letter F, or the peg word is phi, and it starts with the letter F. In the lowercase cursive letter F, you have a loop on top and a loop at the bottom, very much like your number eight, a loop on top and a loop at the bottom. You add two E's and you form the word phi. I imagine a price tag of $8 million attached to the computer. Number nine kind of looks like a B. It also kind of looks like a P. So B or P can be associated with number nine. The word is bay, land and water. So I imagine Ferrari Bay. That's where all the Ferraris go to go swimming. <laughs> number 10 is special. It has two numbers, a one and a zero. Your zero will always be your hissing sounds. If you unravel a zero, if you break it open and you unravel it, it kind of looks like an S. And that's your hissing sound. So you have number one, which is T, and then you have your zero, which is S, and you fill it in with vowels, and you create the word toes. So I imagine 10 toes opening up a can of corn. You see, everybody has perfect memory. The only thing is that those people who say they don't have perfect memory really just have bad recall ability. So the better you impress the information, the more strongly you impress the information, the easier the recall of that information is going to be. Remember your pegs, your main 10 pegs. T, Noah, and then May, Ray rhyme, La, Jaw rhyme, Key, and Phi rhyme, and then you have Bay and Toes. The memory peg system was created by Bruno First and utilized by Jose Silva for the primary purpose of developing visualization and imagination to be able to speak the language of the mind, to be able to describe where you are now and create where you want to go. Another technique that is ideal for recalling information is the three fingers technique. This technique can be utilized to remember information that you read, information that you hear, can be incorporated in test taking for improving your grades in test taking and can also be used as a trigger mechanism to enter alpha as well as to create states of mind that you desire. To use the three fingers technique to remember a lesson that you read, you enter level one using the three to one method. Once at level one, you tell yourself, I am going to count from one to three. Open my eyes and read the lesson. Label the lesson, identify it. Say the lesson title, the subject matter, whatever it is. Add, noises will not distract me. Instead, noises will help me to concentrate. I will have superior concentration and understanding. And then you, you count from one to three. Open your eyes and you read your lesson. When you have finished reading your lesson, Enter your level again using the three to one method. Once at level, you say to yourself mentally, the lesson I have just read, again, mention the lesson title and subject. I will recall any time in the future using the three fingers technique. The good thing about impressing information at alpha or programming yourself to do, do it in this manner is that you're labeling the information. It's kind of like you're filing the information away, making it easier to pull out the information when it's necessary. Now let's say you need to recall that information. Let's say you're going to take a test. Well, you go to your test room, you read your test questions the way you always do in a very calm and relaxed manner. You may want to tell yourself before actually writing down any question, or answering any question to relax and be in control, that the information will come to you. As you read your test questions, answer each one of them whose answer comes readily. If the answer doesn't come, you skip that question and you move on to the next one. That's the first step. The second step is to go back and read the unanswered questions. Put your three fingers together. And if an answer comes to you, then write it down. And if not, you skip that one and you move, move on to the next one. The third step is that should there still be some unanswered questions, put your three fingers together. You read the unanswered question. Close your eyes. 
turn your eyes slightly upward. That helps to produce alpha frequencies. And project your professor or the book or your notes, where you know the information is, onto the mental screen. And simply ask for the answer. Then clear your mind again and then come back to the question. The answer that comes is the accurate information. Stronger information usually comes first. Write that down, but do not turn in an unanswered question on your test. Three fingers technique has many uses, and it's always wonderful to have perfect memory. Remember to stop saying, I forgot. Instead say, it slipped my mind, but it'll come back to me later. Stop saying, I have terrible memory. Instead say, in the past, I used to have terrible memory, but my memory gets better and better every day. Use the three fingers technique, improve your memory, and create states of mind that are going to bring into your life what you desire. All that we have talked about up to this point can be packaged into one neat technique called the mirror of the mind. The mirror of the mind works this way. You enter your level using the 3 to 1 method. Once at level 1, create and project a full length mirror onto your mental screen. The mirror's frame will be blue. The blue frame is to denote the problem or the existing situation. Create an image of the problem, person, thing, or place, whatever, and project it into the blue frame mirror. The frame can be amplified in size to fit within it a large scene or a small scene. You can do anything with your mental senses. Once you study the problem, then you move the mirror towards your left, change the frame to white, and project within the frame the solution image. After that point, every time you happen to think of the problem, think of the solution instead. Imagine the solution, send energy, mental energy, to the solution, and picture the end results always. Now, if you find that when you're using the mirror of the mind, you're getting indications that that programming, that 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 you're working towards is not happening, we call that feedback. All that's telling you is to go back into your level and review what you've done already. Maybe you're limiting the direction from where you're getting your end result. Don't limit the direction from where you get that end result. It could be also that you need to check your six elements. How much desire do you really have or do you have enough? What about belief? Does your belief help you in manifesting what you want in life in that particular goal situation? And expectancy, do you expect the end result to happen? Also check your visualization and imagination. Maybe you're not being honest with yourself when you visualize a problem situation. We need to be very clear and very honest with ourselves and define it very clearly. What about imagination? Is what you're imagining the best thing for you? If not, program for better yet. Check your ingredients and always make sure that the action supports your program. You cannot be desiring to stop smoking and say every day and every way, I want to quit smoking while you're puffing away on that cigarette. That does not then support, the action does not support the program. So always the action must support the program. Desire, belief, expectation, visualization, imagination, and action makes things happen. When you know what you're going to do to get from the problem situation to the end result, then you can insert a third mirror or scene between the blue frame and the white frame. This technique is called programming specific encounters. To utilize this technique, you simply go to your level using the 3 to 1 method. And at level, you project the problem, person, place, scene, what have you, into the first scene or mirror. And then the correction step will follow right after that towards the left and the solution image towards the left of the second scene or mirror. You can use mirrors here or you can use scenes. If you're going to use mirrors here, you may want to give the mirrors color. For instance, you may want to have the first mirror blue, the second mirror green, and the third mirror red. And if you're going to use just scenes, well then just start with the first scene evolving into the second scene and then evolving into the third scene, kind of like a motion picture moving towards your left.
We want to go towards the left because that gives us some, co some kind of spatial control, spatial distinctions to let us know that the problem is here in front of us and the future, the end result, is evolving towards the left. Now when you're utilizing this technique, you go into your level and you view the problem situation. Spend as little time as possible in the problem situation and the most time as possible in the correction scene and then the end result. Let's say you're programming for a job. If you're programming for, the, for a job and you have already made applications for this job and have an interview already scheduled, you go into your level and you project the first scene or the first mirror onto your mental screen. The first scene or mirror always starts center front and moves to the left. The first scene will project the image of your present situation. You have no job, but you do have an interview. Once you study that, you move into the second scene or mirror. If you're using mirrors, the second mirror will be 15 degrees towards the left of the first one. And you project an image of you attending your interview, meeting whoever is going to do the interview or conduct the interview. You also imagine in the second scene that you're in complete and total rapport with this person, that he likes you or she likes you, that things are going very smoothly. You also imagine the state of mind that you have. You imagine your, your level of confidence and how smoothly you're responding to the questions and answering these questions with ease. Once you have done all that in the correction scene or the middle step, move to the third scene or mirror and you imagine the final end result that you are already working there. Let's say, for instance, you're working on a health problem. Let's use an example of someone, of a woman who has a tumor in one of her breasts. The first scene would be an image of the problem situation. She would then visualize the problem, the tumor in, in the breast, as she knows it to be. She spends about one minute of time describing the problem. Then she moves her awareness towards the left of the first scene. And into the second mirror or scene, she imagines all that she is doing to help correct the problem. Maybe she's going through some kind of therapy. Or maybe she's taking some medication. Or maybe she's just simply using imagery. If that is the case, in the second scene, all that is incorporated and the tumor is imagined to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. The third scene would then have the woman with no health problem whatsoever or the next level of improvement that is believable to her. Now, as you get your feedback included into your programming, like in Mirror of the Mind, you never go back to the problem image. You don't do the same thing here. You do not go back to the first scene or the problem image. You simply, once defined, move on to correction and result. Correction and result in your future programmings or in your future meditations. When you get some definite feedback that you're moving in the right direction, well, then you can create a new first scene or mirror and incorporate the changes or the feedback in that first scene or mirror. And then go back to just the second scene and the third scene after that. And keep making changes as you go. This is a wonderful technique, as is the mirror of the mind, because it helps you to get out of denial. The very first step in problem solving is to accept that you have a problem. The second step is to think of many possible ways to come out of that problem situation, to think of solutions or corrections. The third thing to do is to be able to select the right steps to take, the right end result, the right solution, or the right steps within the correction. The fourth one is to put it into picture form, like utilizing the mirror of the mind, or better yet, programming specific encounters technique. The fourth step is to then incorporate these techniques and the last one is to go ahead and take the proper action to make it all a reality. This is truly a technique that can help you to have responsibility over your, over your life, to take the proper steps to make those changes and to attract into your life what you truly desire. Because creative problem solving is a characteristic of a thinking style you get to enjoy in Alpha, you can get together with one or two or more people who are familiar with the Silva techniques. 
By doing so, you come together and think of more creative solutions to any given problem, or you're able to picture or get a better idea of the real problem as it stands from different points of view. This is a great technique to utilize in businesses. Get together with one or more of the other managers or employees it, within a business situation. Bring them together. And all of you together enter level using the 3 to 1 method. Then project the image of the blue frame onto your mental screen. And each one of the persons there then contributes to the problem image depending on how they view it from where they stand in their business, in their company. Let's say, for example, the company is losing money or is suffering some financial losses. Then each one of the members can participate and include into the blue frame how they view the problem is, depending on what they know in their particular department. Once the problem image is very well defined, then together you move the mirror towards the left, change the frame to white, and then everybody then contributes into the solution image from their point of view, from their knowledge, from their experience, depending on what department there is or they're in and their area of expertise, creating a very complete and full end result solution image. Then in the future, when they do their own programming, whether in groups or individually, they keep on sending energy to the solution image, they keep that vision in their mind and they work within a unified vision and they keep their eyes on their goals. Obstacles only happen when you take your eyes off the goals. Keep your eyes on the goal and always think positive towards the end result. This is also an ideal technique to utilize within a family situation. Let's say you have challenges in the family. Share the tools that you have learned with the Silva Method with your family members. Come together as a family. Enter your level using the 3 to 1 method and discuss some of the challenges that you may be having as a family. There could be challenges such as uh, health, for instance. Maybe there's an illness in the family. Maybe there's some behavioral problems with one of the children. Maybe the parents are having challenges. Maybe the family has lost their job, but the parents have lost their job. Perhaps there's separation between the parents or maybe even possibly divorce. If that is the case, bring the family together and analyze the problem situation, incorporating everyone's point of view and feelings into the blue frame mirror of the mind. Then move the mirror towards the left, change the frame to white, and allow everyone to participate in the solution image. This is great for also planning family budgets or even vacations. It can be done for positive goals as well. A family comes together, programs together, plans together. This helps open lines of communication with trust and in love. You could say that a family who meditates together stays together. In order to enjoy your life to the fullest, you need to be in good health. These days, the pressures of modern-day society seem to put a distance between ourselves and health, ourselves and success. We seem to be doing our best that we can to cope with stress on an everyday basis, and it's not easy. As we experience stress, we realize that our body's immune system gets weakened, and truly the number one factor that weakens the immune system is stress. Something else that happens when we do experience stress is that we trigger certain core emotions. And as we trigger these core emotions, they go on to trigger things like anger and fear. Some of the core emotions that we're talking about have to do with a, a feeling of helplessness or hopelessness, a feeling of rejection, or a feeling of abandonment. These are core emotions that are triggered many times when we are under stress and lead to fear and or anger. When you are feeling stress, you can always interrupt that pattern of reaction, lessen the stress effect, and take care of yourself as well. There are three major stressors that we find, and they work on your core emotions. One of the major stressors is your guilt, or do you feel guilty, the guilt complex. That means having done something you shouldn't have done, and now you suffer the consequences of it, or not having done something you should have done, and the same is happening now. You're suffering the consequences of that. To live in day after day, to live day after day with that kind of, of guilt, that kind of stress is very damaging to the immune system. A second stressor is called, or is said to be, 
having lost something or someone of great value, but you can't recuperate it. It's an irrecuperable loss, a loss of a loved one, a loss of a business that you started from scratch and has gone bankrupt. There's no way of getting that back. That too can cause severe stress and weaken the immune system. The third stressor is living and working under conditions you absolutely hate and you have a feeling of being stuck. You can't get out of it. Many people live and work under those conditions and they weaken their immune system day in and day out. Your body is going to tell you something's not right. You've got to do something now. It's going to experience things like digestive problems, peptic, peptic ulcers, things like migraines, tense bodies, things like insomnia. And if you don't listen to those signs right then and there, it gets worse. If you're under the first level of problematic development, we say to go to level, using the 3 to 1 method, for 15 minutes at least once a day. If you are in the second level of problematic development, then go to your level twice a day for 15 minutes. And if you are in the third level of problematic development, then three times a day, 15 minutes every time is necessary. Now notice how you're speaking and thinking because your thoughts are a reflection of how you believe your attitudes as well and that can enhance the stress. What are you saying that is enhancing stress in your life? Think of the negative words or phrases or statements and clean them out and convert them into positive ones instead. That is called mental house cleaning. Things like saying, I can't. Well, be honest with yourself. Is it that you can't or that you won't? Now, when you do experience a shift inside you, when you do experience, let's say, anger or fear, the thing to do then is to stop. Close your eyes, take a deep breath, and give yourself a program. The next thing to do is to take a deep breath and pace yourself. Pace yourself. The third thing to do is to think. What is happening here? What did I just experience? What did I just feel? Is it a feeling of rejection, abandonment? Is it a hopeless, helpless feeling? Because I can't do anything about it. And then see if you can track way back when you first experienced that emotion and the role it played. And does it truly then apply to the situation presently? The next thing to do is to think of a more creative end result, one that you desire instead. And focus on that end result that you desire. And then you open your eyes and you go towards it. If the effect in your life is not what you desire. You change the cause. If the end result that you're getting is not what you want, you're going to change how you're acting that leads to that end result, how you're thinking that leads to that end result, how you're being or living that leads to that end result. You're in control here. Only you can make that change, and your reaction is totally under your control. You can make the difference. This is a process of self-discovering. Learn to use that invisible but very real part of you that can bring what you desire into your life. Don't let the pain of the past or the fear of the future stop you. The past is but a memory and the future is but a dream. And before I go, I want to give you one last technique to ensure success with all that we've talked about up to now. And that is TNT, today, not tomorrow. Use the simple method techniques now and make a difference. Make it a better and better life. And get ready to put the civil mind control method in action.